and welcome to the Myositis Association's Empowerment Clinic webinar series. TMA's Empowerment Clinics are designed to enhance the quality of life for those living with myositis and their care partners. Today's webinar is sponsored by Cryovent Therapeutics, the sponsor of the Valor Study Clinical Trial. The Valor Study is an ongoing clinical trial for adults living with dermatomyositis. Thank you for sponsoring TMA programming. Today's topic is navigating nutritional labels, packaging, and food plates featuring the wellness kitchenista, Jessica DeLuise. We are so excited to have Jessica today on our program. While Jessica is a physician assistant, certified culinary medicine specialist, American Academy of Physicians Assistants, Nutrition Fellow, TV host, on-air guest expert, and Emmy Award winner, she is not an expert on myositis. While there is little research directly related to myositis and diet, TMA can provide information about diet and autoimmune disease and the relationship of immune-boosting supplements on myositis. Stay tuned for TMA's March newsletter for that information. Before we get started, allow me to introduce Taryn Smith. Taryn serves to connect people living with dermatomyositis to the Valor Study clinical trial. She can be reached online at valorstudy.com or by emailing patient support at prioventtexas.com. Taryn has provided that information in the chat box, and now we will briefly share about the trial. Thanks, Taryn, for being here. The Valor Study is a global trial specifically designed for adults living with dermatomyositis. The medication being tested comes in oral form. So rather than an infused medication or an injection, in this trial, participants swallow three tablets by mouth every morning. In many cases, you can stay on your current treatment regimen for dermatomyositis and still participate in the trial. And there is a two to one study ratio in this trial. So what that means is for every three people who join the trial, two of those three people will take the study medication, but they will be divided into groups taking a higher dose of the study medication and groups taking a lower dose of the study medication. For every three people who join, one of the three will receive placebo, which is tablets that look just like the study medication, but don't actually have any active drug in them. This study is committed to access to the trial for those who are interested and eligible. To that end, we are providing um, comprehensive travel assistance for you and a caregiver if needed at many of the trial sites. A study team member can help you determine um, the, the benefits available at your site. And then finally, we here at the Valor Study are committed to making your experience as seamless, comfortable, and friendly as possible. To that end, I am scheduling one-on-one -on -one interviews with anyone living with dermatomyositis who wants to ask questions or hear more about this particular clinical trial. You can find out more by visiting our website. So if you or someone you know is living with dermatomyositis and you would like to ask questions about the Valor study or hear more about the details, I encourage you to visit our website at valorstudy.com. There you can view a quick approximately two minute video uh, detailing the study. You can also answer four easy questions to check your initial eligibility for the study and sign up for time with me to chat in more detail. If you have dermatomyositis, but you think you're not eligible for the study, or if you're just not quite ready to commit to a clinical trial, that is completely fine. I still encourage you to visit valorstudy.com and schedule time to chat with me. Knowledge is power, and I'm here to be a resource for you as you consider this particular clinical trial. But I promise our conversation will be friendly and easygoing with no commitments required. Rachel, thank you so much for having me here today, and thank you to everyone who has attended this presentation. I'm really looking forward to the next hour. Often when I meet people, either after a large presentation such as this, or get a message on social media, often people are motivated and ready to make change. There's never ambiguity. There's often not contemplation. They have been told by their practitioner that they need to make some dietary changes, but where the difficult part is, is where to start. 
they find it a challenge to know what changes to make first, what to even bring up in conversation with their healthcare provider. And so hopefully this presentation gives you some of that information to bring to your practitioner, start a conversation, uh, maybe some tips to review with them, make sure they're safe, and just empower you overall to make and implement those changes that you are desiring to make. To that end, please do not misconstrue this presentation for any medical recommendations. This is simply just to empower, to educate, and hopefully, again, give you some of those tips, tricks, and information to bring back to your the privacy of a, a exam room with your practitioner uh, to have a really meaningful conversation. This presentation was sponsored by the Preavant Therapeutics um, organization that is the sponsor of the Valor study. However, I did create this presentation on my own. Of course, we discussed what the subject matter was, but much of this is factual. And I'm not all of it is factual. All of it is factual, but a lot of it I'm going to give uh, some anecdotal, uh, some tips and tricks of my own opinion in here as well. So just recognize that even though this was a sponsored presentation, I did, I was responsible for putting together the information all by myself. No influence from pre-event therapeutics. Because a lot of this is research-based, because we are using a lot of guidelines and recommendations and from national organizations, things are subject to change. Things are updated regularly. So just make sure that when you are watching this, you keep that in mind. We could be presenting in January and a nutrition label law could be passed in June. Um, so just be aware that things definitely can ebb and flow in the nutrition world. I would absolutely love your feedback. I would love questions. Again, I mentioned at the beginning, I want to connect with all of you. So thewellnesskitchenista at gmail.com or jessica at thewellnesskitchenista.com. Just go ahead and email me. I try to respond to all of my emails uh, in as timely of a manner as I can. Okay. Just a little bit background about me. I am a physician assistant. That is my career path. I've been in clinical practice since 2010. And in 2019, I got a certification in culinary medicine that was from Tulane University. And this was a really neat program, very unique, and one of the first of its kind that I was aware of that gave practitioners, so nurse practitioners, doctors, PAs, an opportunity to expand their knowledge base so they could bring nutrition and lifestyle medicine back to their clinical practice. So it was a very much a program that focused on this adjunct of lifestyle and nutrition, in addition to other things like pharmaceuticals or procedural um, diagnost diagnostic procedures that were necessary. So a very lovely meshing of those two worlds. I am the founder of The Wellness Kitchenista. That is my brand that I do a lot of these presentations and all of my social media education under. We also have a cookbook coming out rather soon, um, a television show that is in the works. It's a season two of a television show. And uh, back in 2020, I actually produced season one. So it was 2020. And then, of course, pandemic put everything on hold. But that is called Eat Your Way to Wellness. It still streams digitally. We won an Emmy Award for that show. And it was a very... Uh, fun program to create, and it focused on different diagnoses, diagnoses and the specific lifestyle and dietary recommendations around those diagnoses. As you know, nutrition is not one size fits all. And even if you have you are the same age, gender, and have the same past medical history as somebody else, there's going to be nuance to nutrition. And so that is kind of the subject of the show, and what I'll really double down on here today. Everything we're talking about could be applicable to you, but you might have you know, a peanut allergy that compounds everything. So just make sure that we're taking everything with a non-literal grain of salt. If you ever watch QVC, I am the Calflon Cookware a brand expert. So I'm on QVC pretty regularly. And if you want to connect with me on social media, the Wellness Kitchenista are my handles. The Conchi Hen House, I do have backyard chicken. So if you're interested in that, um, go to the Conchi Hen House on TikTok. Okay. So let's get into the meat and potatoes of this whole this whole presentation tonight. Uh, we will be talking a little bit about stress. Stress in and of itself is a risk factor for things like type 2 diabetes, heart disease. We'll talk a little bit more about that and how 
systemic steroid use, which may, you may or may not be familiar with in this organ in this group, I think you are, uh, can have similar effects on the body as chronic stress. We will talk a little bit about stress reduction, sleep hygiene, which has nothing to do with being clean for sleep, navigating a nutrition label. So when you pick up a package at the grocery store, what the heck are you looking at? We'll talk about that. We'll go through sodium and calcium, two really important things, uh, calcium specifically if you are on systemic, if you are using systemic steroids, but also in general for the uh, for the pediatric and adult population. Added sugar, what is it? What is what is it not? We'll review how to balance your plate. So we'll go over the standard balance plate from the USDA and then a diabetic version of that as well. We'll review some common buzzwords on packaging. So some things that you might be seeing on the front of your nutrition labels or on your packages when you open those packages at the grocery store. And then we'll go through a few ways to shop on a budget, save money um, and really navigate the grocery store well. Of course, it, this is going to be just the tip of the iceberg. We can't get into all of these things in super, super high depth, but at least enough to get you, get you empowered to get to the grocery store this week or this weekend. Okay, so let's talk about stress. It's stressful to talk about stress, right? It's very stressful to talk about stress. I think we all know that we need to manage our stress better, um, but what is it physiologically? I love this background. I love this information. So stress is mediated by various hormones in the body. Glucocorticoids are one of those steroids that we talk about. Cortisol is one of the glucocorticoids that you're probably familiar with. You may have heard that, but cortisol is released from the adrenal glands. So these are these glands right here that sit on top of either one of our, or both of our kidneys, both sides, right and left kidney, we have adrenal glands. And it works on an HPA axis. So we'll see a diagram of what that looks like in just a second. But basically, normally, cortisol is released in a pulsatile manner throughout the day. So it's released in the morning and then again in the afternoon. For most people, this is how it works. And that's normal. It helps with our sleep-wake cycle, uh, alertness, energy, so many functions. We'll talk about them. It also works in tandem with two other hormones called epinephrine, and norepinephrine. So epinephrine and norepinephrine are really like your fight or flight sympathetic nervous system response hormones. And this is what it looks like. So you either have your circadian rhythm, right? Your sleep-wake cycle or stress, and they're all going to work here on the brain. And then your brain is going to signal to your pituitary gland, which kind of like hangs down here in the middle from your, from your, uh, we'll call it the brain stem right down here. And then that's going to stimulate those kidneys and adrenals to release hormones. And then it kind of works its way back and you get this hormone loop. There are various types of stress. So acute stress, chronic stress, traumatic stress. So if you are, which is kind of a type of acute stress, I think it's a little bit different. In my mind, it's a little bit different when I'm explaining it to people because acute stress could say, could be like you have a presentation that's due tomorrow, right? For work. And you have this acute short-term stress. Traumatic stress is a bit different, right? It could be tra emotional trauma. It could be from a car accident and you're actually getting physical stress on your body um, or a, a physical uh, or a traumatic response to something. They're a little bit different in my mind. So I put that, put that in here, but traumatic stress is often an acute uh, stress. The stress response, again, works with epinephrine and norepinephrine. It's our fight or flight, our sympathetic nervous system. And these are some things that it typically will do. So we have digestive function, uh, urinary function. So it promotes excretion of calcium, which we'll talk about calcium a little bit later, as I mentioned. It's going to promote gastric secretion of acid, regulates our blood pressure, uh, and anabolic effects. So a protein synthesis or catabolism or breakdown of protein and fat stores or uh, glucose stores rather. It'll work on our connective tissue and bone formation. So it really is involved in a lot of functions in our body, sleep-wake cycle, glucose. It's going to play a part in managing glucose, glucose stores, um, blood glucose levels. Our immune system, of course, we know this, right? So acute stress uh, could be that you are sick, right? You are physically and emotionally stressed because you are sick, you have an upper respiratory infection. Our immune system is going to 
function within that stress response. Other things like fat breakdown, fetal development, all of these things. Again, we're not getting too in the weeds with this, but cortisol and the stress response have a lot, a lot of functions in the body. And so those, what we just discussed, were kind of regular, standard, what's happening or should be happening on a regular basis normally in our body. When we have stress, again, some of these acute chronic traumatic stress triggers, we're getting a lot of those same responses. When we have this type of stress chronically, it's no longer a good thing, right? Stress in, in the short term is good. Inflammation is good. We want to heal. We want to say we get cut or an injury. We want inflammation. Chronic stress or chronic activation of that pathway can lead to some negative outcomes. So I think that when we talk about stress or, you know, you see this on social media a lot, inflammation, short term, it's not bad. Short term stress can be, can be very positive. Long term often is when it becomes not a, such a good thing. So this is typically when we tell patients to manage their stress better, it's because they're often under this, the influence or the pressure of chronic stress. So this can lead to emotional, uh, some change in emotional responses to others or becoming emotionally withdrawn. A lot of people um, after being chronically stressed are kind of numb to a lot of things. Uh, change in appetite, sleep disturbances, we will talk about sleep in a little bit, increased drug and alcohol use, uh, high blood pressure or heart disease, type two diabetes, aches and pains, uh, headaches, low energy or chronic fatigue, low libido, heartburn or GI upset, right? You think about um, people say that they have stress ulcers, right? This is kind of like something that we use in our normal normal vernacular. And, um, but you, there's a physiologic background to it. Skin rashes or skin changes, and when we use chronic steroids, so steroids, again, a glucocorticoid, we talked about that, glucocorticoid called cortisol is a steroid that is produced by those adrenal glands we saw in this diagram here. Chronic steroid use can mimic some of those chronic stress effects in our body. So I think this is this is why this background is so important because I, I think that this group is a group that is very familiar with systemic steroid use. They may be using it themselves or have a family member that uses chronic steroids. And I'm sure that I'm sure that some effects of chronic steroid use have, have been discussed between you and your practitioner before. I work, uh, my most recent job as a PA was in urgent care. So every time we would use steroids, uh, whether it be for musculoskeletal injury or an allergic reaction, uh, which is pretty common, obviously, to use steroids, patients would be concerned about those chronic changes or effects because they they were familiar that, they, that chronic steroid use could have these effects. Obviously, short term, I would reassure them it's, you know, we don't often see those, any of those long term effects. Sometimes we get a little bit of sleep disturbance in the short term, sure, but chronically, we're really getting some other effects. Um, and other things that people are using chronic steroids for, just for some context here, obviously dermatocytitis or dermat, yeah, dermat, dermatomyositis, okay, uh, rheumat, other rheumatic diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, COPD. Some people can generally have adrenal insufficiency. They're obviously being prescribed steroids. Um, they're not going, they're just getting steroids so that their body behaves as and functions as we would expect it to on in a healthy person, but still they're using chronic steroids to combat their insufficiency. And so some of these effects will actually mimic, like I said, the chronic stress. What's a really interesting stat that I thought here, about 40% of chronic steroid users might develop, this is might, okay, these are all possible. It doesn't mean you're definitely going to get this, might develop bone loss leading to fracture. So that is a concern, obviously. Um, we'll talk ab about calcium, dietary calcium, but also weight-bearing exercises is something that may have been recommended to you by your practitioner. Uh, the risk of elevated serum glucose or blood glucose level and risk of developing type 2 diabetes, very real. 
pushingoid appearance. I think that you may all be familiar with that. We'll see a diagram of what that looks like in just a second here. GI effects, so gastritis, ulcers, GI bleeding. So if you have ulcers that start to bleed or even um, uh, perforate through some of the GI system tissue, that could be a, a very big problem. Cardiovascular disease, so elevated blood pressure, edema, some electrolyte imbalance might be something that we might see with chronic steroid use. Obviously, psychiatric effects, mood changes, sleep changes. And to be honest, the impact of sleep on your mood is very real, right? Inadequate and on your cardiovascular health. So inadequate rest and sleep can affect your psychiatric uh, status, your cardiovascular status, so many things. This is a cushion going appearance. This is what that looks like. So some stretch marks, we call that striae, skin lesions, humpback, uh, rosy cheeks. So how are we going to manage it? I think this is actually really interesting. There's so much more information that I'm reading about how we actually manage stress and these behaviors that we use or utilize or how we internalize stress. You know, my husband and I deal with stress very differently. <laughs> I, when something stresses me out, so I talk about it get it out in the open, move on. When something stresses him out, he doesn't want to talk about it oftentimes, right? He he takes his time. He sits with it for a while. He thinks about it. So we people manage stress very differently. And that might be a function of how what you saw growing up. But some data will suggest that it's actually how we how our mothers who had us in utero manage stress. So those responses and those behaviors actually start forming as early as in utero. And I just find that, I think the body is amazing. I just find that very interesting. Okay. Oh, we go to the next slide. There we go. So what are some ways that, things that you can do? I mean, a lot of this is not going to be um, a surprise to all of you. We're going to keep a daily routine. Okay. That knowing kind of managing expectations, knowing that, and it's not easy. I have a three and a half year old at home. You know, I have multiple businesses. I know our routine is not easy, but if I know that my alarm is set at a certain time every day, maybe I know that, um, you know, every night I make a hard stop for myself, whether I'm still working after dinner or not a hard stop at six o'clock to, to get off my computer, put down my cell phone, prepare a meal, whatever it is. Maybe at 7 p.m., I know that my spouse or partner and I, we sit and we watch a television show that we really enjoy, right? Uh, sleep hygiene, so getting good quality sleep. We're going to talk about what that looks like. Connecting with others. Uh, we, again, we have a three-and-a-half-year-old uh, foster child at home. I have found so much relief and stress management in the fact that I have support groups and I can engage with others going through similar things and talk about it and share experiences and support one another. That to me is paramount. So connect with others. Okay. Sometimes we don't feel like doing it, but then we actually do it. It can feel really nice and really good. Um, eating a nutritious diet. It's going to, or I'm going to give you some tips and tools for that soon. Obviously it's going to look different for everybody. Exercise regularly. We'll talk about what, what recommendations for exercise there are from our national bodies national organizations, uh, I should say, not national bodies, but for our body, the limit screen time in general. We don't want to follow the new the news um, so, so closely. Let's be aware of what's going on. Let's not ruminate on it. Spend time in nature. Grounding, if you're not familiar with grounding, it's when your skin actually touches the surface of the earth um, and there's some ion exchange, people uh, really find some benefit with stress reduction there. Um, similar effects at it, near the ocean, interestingly or not. So look interested in looking that up, gardening, journaling, um, being mindful. So some people do gratitude journals, mindful journaling or mindful eating is very important. So again, I said, I put my, shut off the TV, get away from my computer, put my phone down when I eat, or at least I try to. That's why I can be mindful. I can be in the moment. I can taste my food. I can enjoy the presence of my partner. I can smell the aromas of the garlic sauteing on the on the oven. And I'm, I'm not just mindlessly eating 
and then maybe not feeling good because I've overeaten or not listening to my body cues about hunger and eating more. So being mindful about, about that mealtime, it's important. And then remedy stressors. Obviously, if there is a something going on in your life that's causing you stress, trying to remedy that as best as you can is important. There is some recommendations for adults for activity. These recommendations that you see here, these are plastered all over social media. If you look up the um, health.gov site, this is what's gonna pop up first. And it talks about moderate aerobic exercise, strengthening in, all, in this combination of the two. That is not going to be applicable to many people with chronic diseases or disabilities. And so it's important to know that exercise is important building muscle around our bones for core strength, uh, decreased risk of falling, uh, make sure that we can help protect our joints, right? If we have those muscles around our joints that are nice and strong, we're, we are protecting some of that mobility of the joints and joint pain, right? It all kind of factors in here. It's it, it, You're going to have to go at your own speed here. Talk with your practitioner about what, how much exercise is right, is recommended for you specifically. And oftentimes, especially if you do have chronic diseases or disabilities, touching base with a physical therapist to teach you proper form, to help you go at your own pace. This is all very, very important. Sleep hygiene, again, <laughs> has nothing to do with being clean for sleep. So first we wanna prepare ourselves for sleep, okay? If you've not heard of sleep hygiene before, this is things like, doing some relax, relaxing activities before bed, right? Reading a book, doing yoga. Um, I, and, and this is not one size fits all. I personally, I know yoga is really good for me. I try to engage with yoga. I, I find it, I, I can't like get into my Zen. I can't, I and this is not the proper terminology. I just can't get into my relaxing phase in yoga. I'm too, my mind is racing. I just can't get there. But going for a walk, you know, no music, just looking at the trees, that really does work for me. So this is going to be no one size fits all, but doing some of these activities before bed, kind of winding down your day, super important. Try to limit nap time. Again, in some populations with chronic diseases or disabilities, nap time is a real need. So limiting those nap times would be important if you can. A regular sleep cycle, going back to that stress management, knowing that, you know, at nine o'clock, this is my hard stop. What doesn't, what didn't happen today won't happen today. And just in setting that boundary for yourself. Uh, we want to eat our last meal of the day about two hours before bedtime. Um, this is also going to be helpful for reflux. So obviously when you lay down, you increase that risk for heartburn and reflux type symptoms. So not only may it help your sleep, it's going to help your GI system as well. If you do have reflux symptoms. Alcohol, we want to limit alcohol and lots of fluids before bedtime. Obviously fluids because we don't want to be going to the bathroom a lot in the middle of the night. And alcohol, sometimes people get confused about alcohol. It can help us get there. It can help us feel a little more relaxed and fall asleep. But it is going to disrupt that rhythm, that circadian rhythm, more than we think it might. after you are yourself, your body is prepped, your prep, your room should be prepped. So prepping your room for optimal sleep. These are things like turning around your clocks, not like, you know, if you do wake up in the middle of the night, you're not remembering that time. You know, how, how awful is it in the morning when you're like, I was up at one, I was up at two, I was up at four 30. So turning around your clocks, um, put an alarm on your clock, put an alarm on your phone. Maybe that's across the room or downstairs, so you know that you're getting up when you need to be getting up. Remove electronics, so TV, radio, tablet. The, a lot of the light on that screen can disrupt our circadian rhythm. It's also distracting. Um, you know, I've done this. I don't, I, not perfect. I've scrolled my phone on social media for hours at bedtime, and I'm just not, I, it just it prohibits me from falling asleep. Optimal uh, temperature. So the Sleep Foundation recommends 60 to 67 is ideal. 
it seems cold, but our body does need to cool down um, before we head into bed. Actually, so uh, to that to that end, some people find um, a cool to warm shower before bed is helpful. Getting that body temperature cool, comfortable bedding, natural fibers, right? We don't want to be sweating um, in 60 to 70, 60 to 67 degrees. You may not be sweating, but uh, you know, cotton, linen, things like that. Nothing that's going to be sticky or sweaty or uncomfortable. And then when you're in bed, you want to limit those activities of, of your bed to sleep. And then the other thing that we're not going to talk about. So really those two things in bed, that's it. As you start to create this routine, if you're finding you put yourself in bed and you're not too sleep, you're not very sleepy, you wait about 20 minutes or so, um, get up, do another relaxing activity, read, journal, then try to go back to bed. You really want to train your body that bed is for sleep. And with consistency, you're going to find success in this. It's not going to happen overnight. Oh, literally, that's a funny joke. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over a multiple uh, over a few nights. It's going to ha happen after multiple consistent work at it. We did talk about chronic stress and cardiovascular health. We also talked about chronic uh, systemic steroid use and cardiovascular uh, steroid use and chronic cardi cardiovascular health. Uh, I never. Um, don't put something about heart health in my presentations. In almost every presentation that I give, there is a caution about heart health. Without chronic stress or systemic steroids or chronic diseases, we ha we are all at risk for heart disease, everybody, okay? Uh, a person dies every 33 seconds in the US from cardiovascular disease. One, about almost half of the people in the US, half the adults in the US, it's 40 something percent have high blood pressure. And the last stat I read from 2021 was that only about a quarter of them have it under control. Almost 700,000 people in the US died from heart disease in 2021. It is a real concern. It's a problem. Obviously, there is genetic factors that play into this, dietary factors that play into this, um, external factors, you know, things that are out of our control that play into this. But just be aware that heart disease is a risk factor. And then all of these other things that we're talking about, poor sleep, et cetera, can increase that risk. So if you're not familiar with what your blood pressure is, you're not regularly checking it, if you don't know what your cholesterol is, if you haven't had a stress test, if it's recommended recently, this is, I implore you, this is your, this is your motivational speech here. Head to your practitioner's office, get your numbers tracked. Okay, let's have some fun. Let's talk about food. This is uh, my, one of my favorite sections and our uh, kind of our halfway point here of the presentation. When you're looking at a nutrition label, let's just run down what you're actually seeing here. So a lot of people, as I mentioned, they're motivated to make change. They want to, but they don't know where to start. And th when they're at the grocery store, they're, they don't have the tools. They just don't know how to look at nutrition labels. So let's talk about it. Serving size. Interesting thing about serving size is a serving size is identified for an item, but it's not what's recommended for that item. What I mean is when you look at a package of... I'm going to go, uh, uh, we'll, we'll say potato chips. The potato chip package is going to have, I'm making this up, a three-fourths cup serving. Okay, maybe that's like, or 20 chips, whatever it is. That doesn't mean it's recommended. That doesn't mean that you should be eating 20 of chips or whatever that serving is. It just means that that is what a typical person might portion themselves out so that the, co so the company then has identified that that is what a typical portion might be. And then all of these numbers underneath that we'll talk about relate to that serving size. This is not like saying you should get, you know, say your practitioner says you should get a half a cup of whole grains every day. And then you go and prepare yourself a half a cup of quinoa. This is different. This is just referring to the package. It's kind of like a standard size. There was a lot of controversy a couple of years ago. And I did notice that food labels were changing because they, those little kind of individual serve snacks that you might get at like a drugstore or a gas station, some of those would have two servings in them. And so it's like unreasonable to think that someone's going to, you know, eat half a bag and then 
put it away for another day, it's unreasonable. So I have noticed that a lot of those single serves have now been changed to one serving. So it refers to the whole bag, right? Which is much more reasonable in an, in terms of amount that someone might actually eat. So that's serving size. You could portion yourself out two servings. You could portion yourself out one, like two, one and one third cup of whatever this food label is. Okay, portioning out is something totally different. A recommendation for a serving from a nutrition perspective from a practitioner, something different, okay? So the calories is obviously going to refer to how many calories are in that serving size. You are going to need various calories based on you, your health history, your activity level, your chronic disease status, uh, your wound status, nutritional status. You're going to need a different amount of calories. It's going to be unique to you. There are certain calculations that a practitioner could do uh, or a dietitian could do. Um, something to keep in mind. And people always uh, find this such an interesting fact. Carbs and protein have the same amount of calories per gram. So, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm, you know, cutting out my carbs, so on and so forth. And then bulking it up with protein. Their nutrition is different, but calories, they're the same. So I think that there's a lot of confusion about carbs specifically and maybe some deleterious or negative effects that they could you know have i'm using air quotes here because because i think that there's a lot of confusion there but carbs and protein have the same amount of calories per gram uh, people always find that fact really interesting fat nine calories per gram so more calories per gram of fat which is why it's important to be mindful of the oils that we're drizzling over our salad and things like that particularly when we're talking about calories um you know fats are very they're in my opinion this is my opinion they're necessary for health right i think most practitioners would would agree things like olive oil great uh, incredible um associated benefits for cardiovascular disease okay so then you're gonna have this middle section here where it's going to go through most of our macronutrients our fat our carb our protein those are the three macros fats are broken down even further into some saturated fat you might also see unsaturated fat poly, you might see these PUFA or MUFA, poly or monounsaturated fats. It actually might say that right here too in that fat label. Not always, but sometimes you'll see it. Uh, monounsaturated fats are those fats that I just was referenced. A lot of the fats you're finding in olive oil. I was just referencing olive oil. Um, polyunsaturated fats, your omega-3 fats, your omega-6 fats. Saturated fat obviously is something that we know uh, we know, studies tell us that when we replace saturated fats with unsaturated fats, we get some positive health benefits in our diet. Um, saturated fat, most most sets of recommendations, including from the American Heart and um, our, you know, our general dietary recommendations for adults, they recommend limiting our saturated fat intake. Sodium, we'll talk about in a little bit, but you're going to see sodium here. Carbohydrates, under carbs, you're going to see fiber. This is huge. A lot of people are missing fiber. Fiber, 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 fiber. I have to just like double down on fiber. It is, fiber is missing because we're not eating foods in their most whole form, whole grains, um, you know, fruit, the skin has lots of fiber, most fruits. It is great. It is, has benefits for our GI health. Some fibers can feed beneficial gut bacteria. Uh, we'll talk about it here in just a second, um, but lots of lots of amazing benefits to fiber. You're also going to see total sugars and added sugars here as well. We'll talk about specifics in just a moment. And then protein, whether it's plant-based or animal-based, you're going to find a protein here. Okay, fiber. Soluble fiber, um, again, GI system, uh, it's, it's going to have some helpful benefits for our stomach lining, reducing the LDL cholesterol. So this is not a, like a super cause and effect talk with your healthcare practitioner. I mean, just because you're eating fiber doesn't automatically mean your LDL is going to be perfect or at optimal levels. I shouldn't say perfect at optimal levels, but it is associated. And we do know that if you start to you know, increase those nutrient dense foods, fiber, start to exercise, lose weight, we can see benefits in our serum cholesterol. We, we, we see this all the time in the clinical setting. Uh, here are some of those sources. And then insoluble fiber, can help with bowel mobility, um, can help make us feel full. And 
certain fibers, as I meant, as I mentioned, can feed those beneficial gut bacteria. They're called prebiotics. And then in that last section, you're actually seeing some micronutrients. So something that, again, there are some certain things that I've really doubled down on, really some take home points here. Here's one of them. When you look at these micronutrients, you're seeing a certain amount of uh, whatever, micrograms, okay? And then over here, you're seeing your daily recommended value in terms of percentages. These percentages are based on a standard diet. So it's not saying that you, I'm going to use Rachel, you, Rachel, whatever your age is in past medical history, two MCGs are going to definitely be 10%. It's not like that. Um, micronutrients, yes, there is a recommendation. Um, you know, obviously for most adults, they're getting a certain amount in their diet, but if, if Rachel, again, making this up has low vitamin D, she might, you know, her practitioner might recommend a different amount every day. So it's not going to translate to the 10%. So just understanding that this is, you know, this MCG is kind of, or the milligrams, this is going to be a good, a good, um, a good piece of information when you're trying to add up your micronutrient content, but these percentages can be a bit confusing. So we're going to talk about eating styles here in just a moment, uh, meaning that is there one particular eating style that is the best? Is there one particular eating style that has associated weight loss? Say that's something that your practitioner has said, you know, lose weight. I, I can't even tell you how many patients I've seen and their practitioners just say that like, okay, lose weight, see any year, good luck, right? And that's all kind of all they get. This is why I love doing these presentations so much. But let's talk about weight loss. It's a big concern for a lot of people. I don't think skinny equals healthy, okay? Um, and I use skinny again with air quotes because what is skinny, right? What is that? I, what does that even mean? But, you know, slender, thin, whatever we quintessentially think about when we think about those words, that doesn't automatically equal health. Okay. Just, just as somebody with a, a bigger body doesn't automatically equal unhealthy. Okay. It really, it, we see associations, of course. Um, we can see, sometimes we can see um, weight loss and have pod, positive effects specifically when it comes to prediabetes, obviously, but it's not the end all be all. It's not something that we should be super hyper focusing on and forget nutrient density and forget exercise and forget everything else. Okay. So it's part of the picture for most people, but not the end all be all. Okay. So when we talk about weight loss though, uh, this is an interesting thing. There have been many studies done where they look at different types of eating styles and then the associated weight loss or cholesterol benefit or cardio, you know, blood changes in blood pressure. And here are some of those studies. And I put some some of the links down here too. Obviously, you can you can Google and, and go to PubMed and find the full articles. I mean, there's so many that have been done, but here are a few kind of interesting ones. One study went through macronutrient um, distribution. So they gave some people high carb, I'm making these up just from recollection. Some Groups, for example, had like high carb, low fat, low protein. Some groups had low carb, high protein, low fat. And they changed all those percentages around. And then they looked at the end at some of the weight loss effects that these groups had. And they analyzed, does it matter what how we're breaking down their dietary composition on weight loss? Like which one was better? Okay. Other studies have been done to analyze some of these more, I'm going to call them trendier fad diets, Atkins Zone, South Beach, Weight Watchers. Which one, which one, which one has most benefit? Like a lot of people might think Atkins, that low carb, because it's so hot and trendy right now, that low carb is going to immediately have the most weight loss, right? But how did it, how did it measure up? Blood type diet. Some people, um, uh, eat for their blood type. So whether or not you had A blood, B blood, O blood, you know, there's a, some, a, a, there was a eating style that was suggested and it is based on your blood type. So does it matter, right? So in this particular study that I'm going to reference, they gave all participants a relevant of their blood type, the type A diet, which was mostly plant-based foods, like legumes, fruits and veggies, limited dairy, limited red meat, limited um, 
uh, breads, but they gave them all of these other nutrient dense foods and irrelevant of their blood type. And then they looked at, okay, well, did just the type A people have benefit or did all the people have benefit? So think about that for a second. Does it actually really matter? And when they looked at the results, so we'll go back to the uh, percentage of fat, protein, carb. So here you can see those breakdowns here. All groups lost weight. When they looked at those trendy diets, all groups lost weight. And in this one, um, the Zone Weight Watchers Atkins, uh, ooh, I have to go back and, and look now, but I believe they were all, they, their differences were not statistically significant. They were pretty similar. Like they all lost similar amounts of weight. In the blood type diet, so giving all people, regardless of their blood type, those nutrient dense, mostly plant based foods, right? Obviously, they're eating some poultry and things, mostly plant based foods, nutrient dense. They all had, they all had lower BMI, waist circumference, blood pressure, serum cholesterol. They saw benefit in all people, regardless of blood type. And I hypothesize, I mean, I really think that this is because. Whenever we put ourselves on a specific eating plan, or I'm going to say diet, although I don't like that, right? When we make change, it really should be a lifestyle forever kind of change. We're removing some of the, you know, the fast food, we're removing some of those more nutrient poor foods, like some of those quote unquote junk foods, right? Desserts. We're often being more mindful. We are making foods from home. Maybe we're losing, using less salt and sodium. We'll talk about salt and sodium. So we're being more mindful of the food we're eating. And I think that has a lot to do with it. I mean, if you think about it, most people are successful regardless of what they're doing. Most people, because they're really, they're sticking to it. They're doing it intense, intensely, right? They're paying attention. Um, and that's a great thing, but it's also could be a detriment kind of thing because it sometimes becomes unsustainable rather than making a lifestyle forever kind of change. Um, a lot of talk about Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet is a more lifestyle focused type of eating. It's great. Uh, I, I personally, I think that I would put myself in this category of eating kind of a Mediterranean diet, diet uh, type of eating style. Focuses on lots of those plant based foods, whole grains. They're not they're not excluding uh, grains. And interestingly. Um, you can look up the PREDIMED study and, and the numerous other studies that have analyzed Mediterranean diet. Often these diets do not have calorie restriction. So, you know, lots of abundant fruits and vegetables, legume, lentils, nuts, as like a, you know, a palm full of nuts as a snack with a piece of fruit. Uh, a lot of this time it's, it's not calorie restricted. They're actually seeing incredible benefit uh, without being so adherent to a calorie max per day, which is very interesting. Uh, fish, obviously a couple of times a week, you're getting fish, lots of fatty fishes, right? Your salmon, your tuna, um, some cheese and some dairy in the form of cheese and yogurt, often in the Mediterranean diet, we're not eating like copious amounts of milk or cream, but fermented cheese and yogurt, yogurt, obviously being a source of dietary probiotics, little meat. So lots of poultry, um, eggs, of course, fish, but little meat. It's typically in those those um, those communities that are eating a Mediterranean diet, they're just not, meat is more of a treat. They're not having it every day. Red meat specifically is what I'm refer referencing here. And then obviously moderate amounts of wine, some wine, not a lot, and very limited dessert or sugary drinks. The wine, talk with your practitioner about how much wine is right for you. It might be zero wine or alcohol in general. So just uh, talk about that. And then sweets. I grew up in an Italian household. Often after dinner, my mom would bring out, uh, and my mom was the, you know, she did a lot of the cooking at home. She would bring out fruit and nuts after dinner as dessert. It was not, you know, we'd sit there and we would, especially when we had extended family over, we'd crack nuts, we'd play cards, right? We enjoyed ourselves. We took time to digest. We weren't stressful right back to work. Um, we ate a piece of fruit and then maybe a cup of coffee. It wasn't so often that we definitely had a uh, prepared dessert. It could have just been fruit and nuts and coffee. This is that study that I was talking about, the PREDIMED study, very interesting. Um, they found a substantial cardiovascular disease risk reduction 
as well as risk of type two diabetes, um, possible effects on aging and cognition. A lot of a lot of info now about uh, the Mediterranean diet and uh, cognitive function, especially later in life. So that's very interesting. And with all of this, mindset matters. I love this study. It was an isolated study, okay? But I think it just shows the benefit of mindset in everything you're doing. So this one in particular, I gave you the links down here. You probably noticed throughout this presentation, all these links down here, I put them like this. They're not they're not in you know the correct scientific reference format. They're just the links. So you could go directly to where I got some of this info from. But this one, they looked at 84 hotel maids across seven hotels. And half of them were told that they met. So they, so they did a self-report first. They asked um, the maids, they self-reported, do you think you're getting a lot of exercise? And of course, I mean, maids, their, their work is hard. I mean, they are like up and down off, on and off their knees. They're making beds. They're cleaning the floor. They're vacuuming. I mean, it is hard work. Um, and, but they all, but they didn't report that they were getting exercise. Most of them didn't think they were getting exercise because a lot of people think that exercise is, you know, going to the gym, whatever. They told half of them that they did in fact meet the surgeon general recommendations for activity and half of them, they didn't, they just let them go on their way. The people that were told they met the surgeon general recommendation for activity had positive effects. Can you believe it? They, they had lower weight, blood pressure, body fat, waist hip ratio, and body mass index. And then they, they asked them again on these self-reports, do you think that you're getting exercise? And the perception of exercise increased. So this is all to say that just because you think it, will it happen? No, but let's have positive thoughts about what we're doing. Let's be very intentional, be very mindful. I just, I love, I, this is just, I love this. The mind is a very powerful thing. And if your mind tells you, you can't do it, in my opinion, in my experience, in my life, nine, 10, at nine out of 10 times, I'm not doing it. If I don't think I can do it, if I'm like, oh, no way, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. So the mind is a very, very powerful thing. Talk about sodium and calcium. Take a moment here. Think about how much salt or sodium is recommended for adults daily. Do you know? Not a lot. It's not a lot. Okay. And the answer, three, two, one. Uh, well, where did my slide go? Okay. Well, we'll get to it in just a second. Hang on. <laughs> Stay tuned on that. Um, let's. We'll come back to this answer in just a second. I know I have it on a subsequent slide. Most of the sodium, as we talked about when I referenced, you know, home cooking, being intentional about our eating style, most of the sodium is coming from prepared, so restaurant foods or packaged foods. It's often not coming from that home preparation, you know, in the salt shaker. So just being mindful that if you are something that's grabbing pre-made foods, and sometimes like this is necessary, right? Because we just don't have the capacity, the bandwidth to prepare a meal. But understand that that's where sodium is coming from. So what are some things that we can maybe do in terms of getting pre-made items that can alleviate some of that sodium burden? Things like frozen fruits and veggies, right? They're convenient. They're easy. Um, things like rinsing the brine in your beans um, before you consume them, rinsing out that salty brine. Like all these things can decrease sodium intake. Here we go. So... For most people, it's about 2,300 milligrams per day. So 2,300, zero, zero, about, that's the, often the recommendation. Sometimes even lower. This is from the American Heart Association, 1,500 milligrams. And if you have heart health, your, or heart disease rather, your cardiologist might be recommending a lower amount of sodium daily. It might be more like that 1,500 milligram mark. But 2,300 milligrams is often recommended for adults. Uh, 2,300 milligrams is about a teaspoon per day of salt. So sodium is that mineral in salt. And excess um, sodium, excuse me, excess sodium can lead to fluid retention, uh, which in, in turn has requires our heart to pump a little bit harder to move that volume of fluid around our body. We can get hypertension, high blood pressure. Um, sometimes we get associated uh, congestive heart failure effects. So people who have congestive heart failure, salt is a big thing. Fluid 
balance is a big thing here, very important to consider. Um, and you might get like, you notice this, like I notice this when I go out to eat, whatever it is, you know, we enjoy it. My husband and I maybe go out and enjoy a meal, my mom and I, whatever. The next day I feel like my fingers, I can't get off my wedding band. I can't pull that off. And that is for a lot of reasons, but one of them is I probably didn't drink enough water and I did eat an excess amount of sodium that day before. So I notice it. I notice sometimes if you're getting those rings around your ankles where your socks are kind of making a little indentation um, and, or you push your, your finger into your shin and you have a little indent there. Those are all signs. Those are all things you definitely need to go to your practitioner and talk about. Um, and those are all signs of potential fluid um, or edema or fluid retention. And specifically when you get that pitting in your lower extremities, where you push your finger and you get an indent, that is directly linked to cardiovascular, kidney health. Um, this is not just a short-term, uh, you know, just happen once in a while kind of thing. That's, that is an indication that there's something long-term chronic happening that needs to be uh, discussed and managed with your practitioner. Uh, the, the interesting thing is salt, no matter what type of salt you're using, has similar amounts of sodium. So right here, this uh, comes from this, uh, where did this come from? I think this comes from, this It was originally from the CDC, this chart, table salt versus like Himalayan salt versus Celtic sea salt, all similar amounts of sodium. There are other factors of salt that we're not going to get into here that I know why people are choosing different types of salt. Even even going so far to say as the function in the kitchen, like a cooking function is going to change with salt. But just in specific regard to sodium, about the same. Okay, so it doesn't mean that just because we're buying a, a sea salt and it's been touted as a better for you salt or a pink salt is touted as better for you salt, doesn't mean you're liberally using it and just pouring it all over everything willy nilly. This might look like a standard lunch or dinner for most people. This sandwich has about 1,500 milligrams of salt, almost almost or exceeding, depending on where you are, that daily recommended amount of sodium. So options for decreasing salt, simple things. Like instead of deli meat, we could swap out fresh chicken. You could get a rotisserie chicken, pre-made, super easy. We eat them often. Um, pull the skin off, shred that chicken make a lovely chicken salad with maybe some avocado or just or just chicken. Just put a chicken, just slap a piece of chicken breast right there in your sandwich or, or chicken thigh, whatever you want. Um, you could opt for an open face, like more of a, a lovely, you know, toast that restaurants are ch charging an arm and a leg for like a lovely little avocado open face toast. You could eat, eat, you remove the bread. You could eat this in a veg, right? You could do like a pepper sandwich to remove and then keep the rest of it. Instead of cheese, lots of fresh veggies, you know, um, which fresh veggies are going to add fiber, water content, and so many other benefits to fresh veggies, including nutrition. So lots of options here. If you want a quick on the go lunch, it, you know, this is, you can make some easy, pretty cost effective swaps to decrease sodium content. Don't discredit too a peanut butter, a whole grain piece of bread with maybe um, peanut butter with no added salt. This is the one I buy a no added salt peanut butter and some fresh fruit could be, could also be an option. Okay. It doesn't have to be complicated or like go gourmet. When it comes to sugar, true or false, take a moment to think about this. Is, are all these things added sugar, high fructose corn syrup, cane sugar, molasses. Now really think about this critically, coconut sugar, maple syrup, agave. These are supposed to be, a you know, honey, supposed to be a little bit better for you versus high fructose corn syrup. Are they all considered added sugar? They are. They are all considered added sugar. Why? It's not the same as the sugar found in your kale, your potatoes, your berries, not the same. That is not considered added sugar. When we talk about added sugar, again, Natural sugar, most, I just had somebody just comment on one of my videos on Instagram like a couple weeks ago. And um, they said that their practitioner has does not have them on a natural sugar restriction, meaning that she could, and she has prediabetes, she lost, after doing that, she lost weight, et cetera. Natural sugar, most practitioners will say, as long as you're balancing that with maybe some peanut butter or nuts or a piece of cheese, 
there should be not, a, there's most people are saying don't, there's no restriction on natural sugar, but on added sugars often found in more packaged items um, or more processed items that might not have as much nutrient density as a fresh piece of fruit. There are often restrictions put on that. And um, the, the American heart has certain restrictions. And of course our governing bodies have certain restrictions. So most adults no more than 10% of total calories or the American heart will actually break it down in terms of teaspoons for adult men and adult women. So just being mindful and, and again, talk with your practitioner about natural sugars and should you have a restriction on those? Should you be balancing them with other foods to help blunt that glycemic response or not? And added sugars, this is the, the general recommendations, but how much is right for you? For somebody who has maybe very poorly managed uh, diabetes, maybe there's no added sugar. Maybe your practitioner says, you know, despite this recommendation for most healthy adults, you have these chronic diseases that make it that you should not be having added sugar. It, it's very, it's possible. So just be mindful that there are so many names for added sugar. I mean, like over 50 that could, it could be listed on the label uh, under the ingredients list. It's also going, going to be, it's mandated to be under that carb, that carb on the nutrition label, those carbs. So just make sure you know where you're looking for those ingredients and you're being mindful of it. There are some non-nutritive sweeteners. Some people call them artificial sweeteners that you're going to see on the label. Things like this, like saccharin, um, sucralose, truvia, monk fruit, you're likely not seeing these on the nutrition label under carbs where I showed you, but sugar al alcohols, you are. So things like you might see carbs, I'm making this up, carbs total is 10. Underneath, it'll say sugar alcohols, nine grams. It's because it's one of these, like sugar-free gum. Um, I'm trying to think, but sugar-free gum is probably the best example. I'm trying to think of other examples right now. Uh, sugar-free, oh, toothpaste. I just saw one with, that had these sugar alcohols. So you're going to see them listed under the nutrition label. But again, some of these other ones, you're not. And being, and remember that some of these sugar alcohols will give some people some upset stomach, bloating, gas. Um, I had a patient in the urgent care who came in and was having bloating and gas and wanted testing, thought she had a GI bug and we teased it out a bit. And it came down to the fact that she was eating a lot more of this sugar-free gum. Um, and she was, it was causing bloating and gas. And so we, talked a little bit about um, some changes that she could make when it comes to her, oh, hold on, when it comes to her, um, to her diet and things that could be really be very helpful. So so let's talk about calcium. We've already spoken a little bit about the risk that systemic steroid use has on uh, our bones, right? Our risk of fracture. We also talked about some uh, excretion of calcium via the kidney channels with the stress response. In 20, the 2022 American College of Rheumatology Guidelines, they recommend that if you are on uh, systemic steroids to have some sort of age-appropriate calcium and vitamin D supplementation uh, while you're on those oral steroids or systemic steroids. This may be different. You might, again, I think we used an example earlier. You might be low in your vitamin D and you might have require more vitamin D, for example, or a certain amount of calcium. Talk with your practitioner about that, but often they are recommending supplementation with calcium and D. This is in addition to Weight-bearing exercises, right? Um, we know younger in life, weight-bearing exercises can help with bone uh, deposition and strength and thickness. Um, not so much later in life, but of course, that's how it's later in life. Bone weight-bearing exercises are helping with uh, our muscles, our stability, our core strength, uh, avoidance of smoking, and uh, avoidance of excess alcohol intake. Again, no alcohol might be right for you. You have to talk with your practitioner about that. Vitamin D is works in many ways to help with calcium levels. Uh, one way in particular is it helps to absorb dietary calcium. So obviously vitamin D 
Um, there's some activation that might happen in the skin with precursors, but dietary uh, calcium is often um, better absorbed with vitamin D. Sorry, I said that a little kind of choppy there, but, um, and vitamin D might be supplemented with food. It might be supplemented with a supplement. Like I said, sometimes there's some activation of vitamin D in our skin, but oftentimes they're recommending it supplemented with the calcium. So where are our sources of calcium coming from? This is a great resource. Again, another take home point. If ever your practitioner recommends a specific nutrient, you can go right to the NIH. The NIH has great fact sheets and they'll go through how much is recommended over here, age um, by age and sex, or even in pregnant or lactating people. Um, you're looking at this recommendation in terms of how much. So when we looked at that nutrition label, you're getting those milligrams or micrograms, how much? Then where does it come from? Here are some top rich sources. So this is calcium, yogurt, mozzarella, sardines, et cetera. You could pull that right up on that health professional health professional fact sheet on the NIH. Literally go to Google and go calcium health professional fact sheet and the NIH and it should pop up. Same thing with vitamin D. How much is recommended? Pregnancy lactation. Where are those rich sources? So a lot of similar places too, by the way. And then salmon. Salmon's great. Cod liver oil. Um, certain fishes, eggs. You can see that a lot of these foods also align with what we just talked about, the Mediterranean eating style. This is a balanced plate diagram. Um, very, very helpful. I find this a great visual representation of how we should be putting food onto our plate at every single meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This is from the USDA. It's based off a 10 inch plate with an eight inch center for diameter. Um, I added, so remember remember at the beginning, I told you that almost all this is factual, but I am adding my little anecdotes here. So I added fats and desserts. So this is the original diagram, grains, protein, veg, fruit, dairy. I added fats and desserts. <clears throat> fats like your olive oil, fats like uh, in your olives, in your avocados, in your bananas, that's where fats are coming from, in your dairy. Uh, desserts. What does a dessert look like for you, right? It's going to be different for everybody, again, based on are you allowed to have added sugar or not? Do you have prediabetes or diabetes risk or diagnosis or not? It's going to vary, but I always feel like this is more of a, feels like a more balanced and complete plate to me when I include dessert. Oh, I clicked on it. Sorry about that. Let's go back to this. Just some nuances here. So make all of your uh, grains, or at least half of them, I would say try to make all of them if possible, of your grains whole. So whole grains like quinoa, rice, brown rice, um, oats, whole wheat flour, things like that, versus a refined grain that might be less nutrient dense, less fiber rich, things like that. Uh, focus on nutrient density versus nutri nutrient poor. I did mention this earlier before, but obviously fruits, vegetables, um, things that are going to have lots of color, lots of diversity, all very nutrient rich foods. N nutrient poor things would be like, you know, instead of a red strawberry, a nutrient poor would be like a red strawberry flavored Skittle, right? Not much nutrition there. Still red, still strawberry flavored versus a fresh strawberry. Uh, don't restrict unless medically necessary. Again, I think that this goes back to uh, sustainability of, of change and making sure that we're implementing changes that can be very long-term and more lifestyle focused versus quote unquote diet. Choose unsaturated fats. Again, olive oil, avocados, nuts, great source of unsaturated fats. And remember, all things have a mixture of fats. But when we talk about sources of fats, it's the predominant source. So like olive oil has a lot of different types of fats. Primarily it's the MUFA, that monounsaturated fatty acid. Instead of sodium, use lots of dried spices. Uh, so like if you look at the label, it's just dried spices only. Zests, juices, lots of flavor. Frozen 
fruits and veggies, frozen protein fillets, very cost effective option. Uh, very easy and convenient to keep on hand for a quick dinner. And then shop the perimeter of the store. I'm going to show you what that looks like here in, in a little bit. If you have risk for diabetes or diagnosis of diabetes, you might be showed something that looks like this. So you might be shown something like look, looks like this if you if you have no none of those risks. But if you do, see how this is a little bit different here. You have half the plate non-starchy vegetables which versus fruits and vegetables, okay? Your carbohydrate foods. So these are going to be now here's going to be your fruit. So they are including some fruit here because these are carbohydrate rich, rich rather, um, and your whole grains here. So fruits, veggies, whole grains, all here. Your protein foods. And then this is based off a nine inch plate. Okay, this is a nine inch plate versus the 10 inch plate. And this is nine inch uh, with food rim to rim. There's kind of none of that barrier around the circumference like this one. And then instead of milk, a water or zero calorie drink would be here. I still added fats and desserts because again, I feel like that's a complete meal. What that looks like is gonna be different for everybody. So just a visual of like real food, what this might actually look at like. If you're eating these foods and this is kind of typical, it might be typical for some of my patients, a full plate of pasta, meatballs, um, maybe fried chicken and, and French fries. It's not so much that you have to not eat these foods, but they do, especially as you're first starting to make changes, right? You, you can't restrict totally. This is my opinion now. This is not medical advice. My opinion is, it's, it's, you can't restrict totally. Okay. I know for me, that does not work. Restriction in general is a, is not a sustainable long-term option. It's not realistic. So what might this look like? What might you be able to bring to your practitioner? Like this might be a slide you can bring to your practitioner and say, are these foods okay? Can I incorporate it like this? Can I include a, a beautiful, rich, um, colorful, lovely salad with an apple and a little bit of pasta with some, you know, some meatballs and maybe instead of the flour meatballs, I've used oats, right? Can I eat a little bit of this fried chicken? Obviously, this is probably not a whole wheat flour on that fried chicken, but again, making, aim for, you know, as many of your grains as you can whole, at least half is recommended of your grains should be whole. Um, nuts, nice fats, olives, veggies, all great here. And then I have some gummies. Uh, as a dessert, this might be regular gummy bears. This might be the sugar alcohol gummy bears, whatever it looks like for you. It might just be another extra piece of fruit with like a fresh whipped cream. I don't know. Talk with your practitioner about what kind of desserts are, will work for you. This is, these are just another other visuals of how this might look. It's not going to necessarily fit into this diagram, but it might look more realistic like this. So your protein scattered throughout the plate. This is a little bit heavy in the pasta, but I think you get the, the idea here. Uh, this is lovely, right? This is a plant-based option, but you get protein and fiber from your beans, protein and carbohydrates from your quinoa, protein from your egg, and lots of colorful vegetables. Carbs here from your potatoes and your quinoa, okay? So often, again, Lots of fat, certain fat sources will have a mixture of fat. Certain food will have a mixture of macronutrients. So the more you familiarize yourself with these foods, the easier it's going to get. This is a lovely breakfast option. You have your corn tortilla, your whole grain, that's your carb, your protein and your eggs and your veggies and your fat. Like that's a lovely breakfast, right? This is probably more realistic in terms of your pasta portion. This one up here with the soba noodles and your veggies and your protein. And again, by the way, a lot of this is looking like how we might really eat, right? Like this is how we might, really, these are real food options. So we've already, we so we've spoken about a lot already. We've spoken about nutrition labels, how to read them, some meals that might uh, fit into that USDA balance plate or the diabetic friendly balance plate. Now let's talk about the front of our labels because you're going to, you see some of these words at the grocery store and you're like, does that actually mean, and of course it means something, but does it actually mean what I think it means? And does it actually mean something significant to me? I think are the questions that we should be asking ourselves. Free range. So free range is defined by the USDA in terms, when it comes to uh, poultry, so like chicken. And it means that they were given free access to the outdoors 
for more than 51% of their lives. So access to the outdoors could be like little holes out to a concrete area. Like we really don't know what access to the outdoors actually means. So it can be confusing, right? We don't really actually know what that word means. We know how it's defined, but what does it look like at the farm? The, the uh, Certified Humane Society, they, if you see the Certified Humane emblem here on your packages, they have identified what that means. So they're giving it a certain um, square foot per bird. Okay, they're actually saying that each one of these little hens has two square feet and et cetera, et cetera. So, so you can look up these definitions, but that's what that means. When you Then when you go a bit a step further, free roaming or pasture raised, pasture grown, meadow raised, you're seeing some of these words there too. It's a, it can be a little bit confusing, but the certified humane de definition, if we look right here, it requires that per 100 birds, um, sorry, 1,000 birds per 2.5 acres. So it's giving a square footage per, per bird. And that it also talks a little bit about their feeding, that they're actually, uh, instead of really being supplemented with some of this feed lot, food, they're probably getting much more of their food from this free range pasture. So if you read these in more depth, so they're actually talking a little bit more about the type of outdoor access. Um, if you, if this is something that is important to you, I should preface this with saying, this is not how we recommend patients eat. It is not a necessary thing or way that patients eat, but this is very important to a lot of people, particularly when it comes to animal, animal, um, care and um, nutri nutrients that they're consuming throughout their lives. So it becomes a concern to a lot of people, which is why I put this in here. And also to bring up the point that sometimes, again, things don't mean exactly what you think it might mean. So making sure that if this is, is something that's really important to you and you're choosing options that you're looking maybe on the Certified Humane website about what the definitions are, then finding foods that have that emblem. We're going directly to the farm. I'm in Philadelphia, but believe it or not, we have great farmers markets, great access to farms in Lancaster County, New Jersey, um, and all around Pennsylvania. Kind of the same thing here with free range and when it comes to terms of eggs. So obviously this is not free range with chickens in a in cages like this. But this might be, this might be free range. It's just not what we're thinking about when we think free range. So thinking about this, thinking about this when we're making choices, when we we are consumers, we at the end of the day, we do have power. So if this is important to you and we want to make meaningful change, we can do that through the choices that we make. It's This is not realistic for everybody. We Not everyone's going to have access to, to food that says free range or pasture range or whatever, like just depending on where you're shopping. But again, if this is important to you, this is what it means. Local is a big one. So a lot of people wanna support local business. They wanna support local farmers. What does it actually mean? So the 2008 Farm Bill actually identifies what local means when we see it on our food. And it basically means that either when you're, you're purchasing that food, it was either made in the same state that you are in. So like, for example, um, like Pennsylvania, if you know, if I'm in Pennsylvania all the way near New Jersey and there's a farm all the way near Pittsburgh, which takes me about five-ish hours to drive to, um, it, that that would be, I could be buying something that's quote unquote local, but it doesn't necessarily maybe mean what I think it means. I mean, I'm, all, I'm obviously willing to support Pennsylvania farmers, but if I'm looking for something hyper, hyper local in my town, for example, that's not, that's not what I'm getting. It also can be within 400 miles. So if we're crossing state lines, it's going to be about 400 miles from where you're buying it or in that same state. Again, if it's important to you to support local businesses, go directly to that business. Uh, go directly to that farm. Order online directly from those places. All natural. So this is defined. And when you see it on meat, poultry, eggs, it has to meet two criteria that there's no artificial flavoring, coloring, or chemical preservative, um, or any other ingredient isn't synthetic, <clears throat> and it's not more than minimally processed. So like, you know, all natural hot dogs, 
could we argue that these are more than minimally processed? We could, but at the end of the day, these sometimes these definitions are very vague. So I don't want someone to see this word natural and say, well, this is very high quality, very nutrient dense, what I need to be eating. Natural, like natural flavor means something. Natural here, I don't know what it means really. So I think, you know, rather than paying attention to a lot of these words, look at the ingredients, look at the nutrition label. We know we now know how to how to navigate that and and see is this something that fits into my dietary plan or not? Forget some of this other stuff that you're seeing up here. Whole grain is a big place where this comes into play. So um, there's a difference between whole grain or something that says 100% whole grain and made with whole grains. So made with whole grains means that there's whole grain in there, but is it our primary source of grain? Maybe not. So sometimes if I'm buying a whole wheat bread, for example, I'll look for the words 100% whole grain or 100% whole wheat. Wheat is just a type of grain. Grains could be rice, barley, amaranth, um, teff, uh, oats, right? Those are all grains. Wheat is just a type of grain. So 100% whole grain or 100% whole wheat. If you're doing whole grain, uh, barley um, would be another option. There are some grains that have gluten. There are some grains that don't. So obviously, again, this is going to be nuanced to nutrition, uh, nuanced to nutrition that's going to be different for everybody. Here are some examples. So this penne, whole grain, whole grain durum wheat flour is the ingredients, right? That's it. It's whole wheat flour at the end. The cheese it made with whole grains, we see whole wheat flour here, but enriched flour up here. Enriched flour is not bad. I'm not saying you should never eat it. I'm just saying know what you're buying, okay? I'm, this is, there's no morality here to the food, that I, these things, that, these examples I'm sharing, not good, bad, or indifferent. It's just know what you're buying, know what these foods mean. And especially if you were a practitioner, I said, go get whole grains. Well, then now you, now you know where you need to go look and what you need to look for when you buy that product. Uh, smoke point, I add this in here is very interesting. Um, smoke point is a, basically it's the temperature at which oil can be heated. <clears throat> before it starts to burn and smoke and change, change its chemical structure. So when we are buying oils, it's important to buy oils for function. For example, we talked about what, olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil has a relatively low smoke point. So you're not like pan frying in olive oil. You're just, you're steaming veggies and then drizzling. You're putting it over salad. You're not, you know, having high heat cooking when it comes to, to extra virgin olive oil. Avocado oil is something that I often will uh, do a quick pan fry or saute with has a very high smoke point. So I'm going to be, it's going to be able to sustain and withstand those higher temperatures before it burns and tastes really gross, start smoking in my kitchen and we get a chemical structure change. And then we get um, a byproduct once that structure starts changing and the oil starts to burn or becomes, you know, if an oil becomes rancid called free radicals. The reason we eat antioxidants or one of the reasons we eat antioxidants is for free radicals, which can be tissue disrupting. So again, more in depth than we need to know here, but the, the driving point of this slide is buy oils that are uh, based in, uh, that you need for their intended function, right? Think about that. Butter, 350, we're often baking at 350 with butter, okay? Coconut oil, same thing. A lot of people are saute pan sauteing or deep frying coconut oil. Really, it's it's like a baking swap if you want a dairy-free alternative is really a good spot for, for coconut oil or a great hand moisturizer. <laughs> um, so when you get to the grocery store, uh, we mentioned earlier shopping the perimeter, go into your produce. This is how I typically will navigate the grocery store. Go to your produce section, fill up your cart over your fish, your meats, your poultry, your eggs, your dairies, then maybe getting some uh, bread or some, some whole grains your nut butters, heading into the uh, main center, the center of the grocery store, get your legumes. Again, your oats, your condiments, pickles, nuts, canned items. I'm not afraid of canned items. I know there's some concern with BPA. You could buy a BPA-free can. Biggest driving, uh, biggest take home point here, I think is, listen, they're accessible, they're convenient. Um, just rinsing that salty brine off can be very, very helpful. But I will often grab 
dried or canned items and stock up on them. They're they're easy. At the end of the day, they're easy. It's not my primary source of food, but it's definitely something we incorporate into our meals regularly. Frozen items, this is more of a primary source of food for me. Frozen is super convenient. Often frozen at the time that it was uh, picked from the farm when with specific respect to fruits and veggies. Nutrient density, quite comparable to fresh. Uh, often cost effective. I can buy them in bulk. So I'm often using frozen items, frozen fish fillets, all of it, all of it. Then by that point, your your card is full. You're you're having that like cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching in your mind. Then you might grab a few of those less nutrient dense items, maybe your dessert, and then you're out of there. You're checking out of the grocery store. Remember that in terms of budget, um, seasonal fruits and veggies, you know, things that are in season are going to be less expensive. They're often trying to move them off the off the produce counter quickly. Um, you might even see them in your circular, some deals. Meats and fish, uh, buying in bulk is great. Buying frozen is great. Talk with your butcher about when they're marking meats and fish down. They might be marking them down. You could stack up on those inexpensive um, options and then freeze them. It's often what we do in our house. So we know when our butcher marks things down at our local grocery store. Uh, frozen, I think I can't, I just do it, buy it, get it, stock it. Um, unit pricing, obviously comparing your unit pricing of a brand versus a store option. A lot of times the store options, um, they're great. They're, they're just store labeled and they're really high quality items. So just look at those, look at the ingredients and look at the unit pricing. And then remember that end caps are not the best deals. Uh, end caps are things that the grocery store needs to move quickly. They want to throw it in your face, get it out the door. Um, and this also comes into play when we look at where things are located on the shelves. Companies pay for their spot on the shelf. I don't know if everyone knows that. They pay to be there. So if you're if you're looking at eye level or like just a little lower or higher than eye level right there, that costs the companies more. They want you to see them. They want you to grab them. So don't be afraid to look at the very bottom shelf, look at the very top shelf and compare prices and just look for some options. And that concludes our presentation this evening. I... I'm so grateful to have been here. I want to remind you that I share tips. I share videos, recipes, uh, the Wellness Kitchenista on everything, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, I do a lot of video content. Uh, YouTube, it's all there. You can head to thewellnesskitchenista.com and get all of my information. And then if you want to set up a meeting, if you want to talk any more about anything, you have questions, you want to give feedback, um, you want to discuss maybe a cooking class. I do lots of cooking classes for groups where we do it virtually. I cook in my kitchen, you cook in yours. You get all the ingredients and tools ahead of time. Um, if anyone uh, has any other events or they need speakers, just set up some time on my calendar. This goes directly to me. This is not uh, barriered by my assistant. This is not, you're getting me directly when you send an email or when you schedule on my calendar. So if you want to do that, there's the link. You could do it right then. And I hope that we all connect after this presentation, I thank you so much, Rachel, the Myositis Association, um, Priya Vant, thank you so much for asking me to speak. And I hope you find value in this and it opens up some really meaningful uh, conversation. The last thing I will leave you with is, I often will say this to people, often where you're at now, these are things that, these are places that and positions and statuses that didn't happen overnight. That's to say, it's going to take time to make change. And, you know, if you look back at choices you made along the way and you want to make changes, well, just look at how long you've been making those changes and why it's so hard to, to or sorry, those choices and why it's so hard to make change. Um, because it, it, it didn't happen overnight. And, that, and so to change a certain habit or a uh, a recipe or something is going to take time. It's going to take consistency. Um, start slow, especially when it comes to sleep hygiene. You know, I listed out like 25 things on those slides. Start with one thing. And then once you've mastered that, move on to the next. It just is going to take time. Don't take time. Don't get, don't get discouraged. Um, have patience with yourself, have grace with yourself and uh, you can do it. So I thank you so much and take care. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone, for today's presentation. 
As a reminder, Jessica's presentation was brought to you courtesy of the Valor Study, a global clinical trial for adults living with dermatomyositis. If you'd like to learn more, please visit our website at ValorStudy, that's V-A-L-O-R study.com. There you can find details of the trial, read frequently asked questions with their answers, and schedule time to chat with me one-on-one -on -one about your interest in the trial. If you're an adult living with dermatomyositis who is interested in a new investigational oral treatment option, we would love to hear from you. Thanks again for coming and for your kindness and attention.